I'm Julia Kim, and I'm a Senior Program Advisor at the Gross National Happiness Center in Bhutan. And I work closely with Dr. Sandhu Chetri, the Executive Director, and Dr. To Ha Ven, who is the Program uh, Director uh, in developing a lot of the programs that we're delivering at the GNH Center. So uh, GNH stands for Gross National Happiness and it really expresses Bhutan's unique development philosophy and the letters are really a counterpoint to gross domestic product, um, GDP, which is uh, most people are familiar with as a measure of economic progress and development. So gross national happiness really places the emphasis on the H part, happiness, uh, well-being of all life forms and a recognition of the interdependence between human well-being and the environment and sustainable development, and it says, it says that this should be the focus of our measure of progress in development, mm -hmm. and not just material progress, and not just how well the economy is growing. So that's GNH. Um, sure. Um, GDP is really uh, a formula uh, that was devised um, by the Bretton Woods Institute. Uh, the World Bank and the IMF um, after World War II as a way of really looking at how the economy is progressing. It was never intended to be a measure of how countries are doing overall. It was never really meant to be an indication of how well a country is doing in terms of its development, but over time it's come to mean that um, and to really take on a kind of importance in the political and economic sphere that is maybe not what it was originally intended for. Um, gross national happiness, on the other hand, is really deliberately trying to take a more holistic way of measuring human progress. And in Bhutan, it has nine different domains, which include the usual suspects, which you would usually measure, such as poverty or the economic well-being of a population, education levels, um, and um, health but it also includes some very unique measures that are very important to keep track of, such as environmental sustainability, um, how well we're doing in terms of time use and our work-life balance, cultural diversity and richness, um, and good governance. All of those are different domains that uh, gross national happiness measures, but GDP does not capture. Where to begin? I guess GNH is uh, a better measure for um, well-being and human progress, I think, uh, than GDP, because it really is trying to look at what is important to us. You know, what is what expresses our well-being? What is the purpose of development? And from the experience and the philosophy of gross national happiness, it really is well-being and happiness uh, of all life forms. And that is, I think, a superior way of looking at our progress than just how much products we're producing within a country, um, what we're um, pr producing as an economy is not really expressing how well a population is doing. For example, you can have uh, GDP continuing to increase within a country, and yet happiness and well-being of the people within that country is not necessarily increasing as well. And that's a pattern that we're seeing in a lot of rich countries now that beyond a certain level of baseline um, economic activity where people have the basic things like housing and education, increases in GDP do not actually correspond with increases in how people are, report their happiness and well-being. It can plateau or even start to go down. Uh, another critique of GDP is it can continue to increase in a lot of developed countries and yet uh, income inequality really starts to increase as, at the same time. So although it looks like the economy is doing really well, um, the gap between rich and poor is getting wider and wider. And you start to see increased crime, increased breakdown in social trust, um, worse, health, worse health outcomes, worse educational outcomes. So it, does, it actually masks a lot of things that are important for well-being. I think the other reason that um, GNH is better than GDP is um, GDP counts all economic activity as being positive, as being a good thing. So if you have a lot of natural resources, such as Bhutan, a lot of um, forest, 
and you cut that down for timber and wood, that will count uh, as a, a positive gain in GDP. Whereas if you look at it from an environmental or sustainability viewpoint, it's quite disastrous. It's, it's not good for the well-being of that country or for the planet. So I think GDP has um, some shortcomings that GNH is really trying to address. And GNH um, looks at things from a much wider perspective of what is the purpose of, of our, our existence, what is the purpose of development. So I think the GNH Center is really trying to um, bring GNH down to earth, you know, so it's not just a lot of talk or measurement or policy even. Uh, all of those are important, but I think equally important is how do you actually apply it in real life and what does it mean for a, a typical Bhutanese person and what could it mean for uh, international visitors who are wanting to implement a similar development philosophy in their own countries. So the GNH Center is really trying to work with um, Bhutanese um, entrepreneurs, people working in organic farming, people working in, in education, to really see how we can apply these principles in real life and really help uh, Bhutan steer its development path so it doesn't just go the route of rapid economic development as India and China, their next door neighbors are. So what does that mean on the ground? It means, for example, this youth camp that we recently had in Bhutan, in Bhutan where we brought together uh, Bhutanese young people and international young people to share their world views, to get their hands dirty actually building a camp, and to live in nature um, as, as sustainably as they can. And I think from the Bhutanese point of view, it's really important for them to see that um, modernity and all the conveniences that come with modernity also come with a price, and that there's something really valuable and sacred about the land that they're, they're living on. Often you don't see that because it's so obvious that it's invisible in your own country and it's not until you see how others regard it that you can really see what your own country has. I think Bhutan is also going through um, a very critical time in their own development where young people are being exposed to the internet, um, to popular culture, to tourism in a way that they, their parents' generation never have. And in the same way that um, that can have positive impacts as it has in a lot of developing and middle income countries, it can also have really devastating impacts on the culture and on the, the well-being of, of people who are going through that kind of rapid transition. So I think that kind of exchange between young people um, in Bhutan and visitors from abroad is really important. And that's one program that we've been implementing. I think it's really um, an exciting time for GNH because there's been a lot of international interest and within the GNH Center we've hosted a number of international programs. One of them was uh, funded by the German Ministry of Development and was in collaboration with the Presencing Institute in Massachusetts. And it was really to bring together uh, business leaders, civil society leaders and government leaders to come together to experience GNH in Bhutan and to think how they could innovate and develop their own prototypes when they went back home. So this included the Governor of Oregon and the First Lady of Oregon, who have been trying to introduce um, a new measure of progress in Oregon called the Genuine Progress Indicator, or GPI, which um, pays much more t attention to the uh, impact on the environment than uh, other measures that are currently in place. Um, it included uh, Michelle Long, who is the Director of Bali, or Business Alliance for Local Leading Economies, Local Living Economies. And it's a network of businesses that are really trying to innovate um, to make business much more accountable to local communities, um, to have the triple bottom line at mind. So not just the economic or financial bottom line, but the impact on the environment and the social impact of a business. And to allow them to go back um, to the United States in this case and try out their own GNH version of uh, projects in their own countries. The GNH Center's long-term vision, I think, is um, quite ambitious. You know, it's really uh, on, on the level of Bhutan, as much as possible trying to help um, the vision of GNH that was originally articulated by the fourth king and is in the constitution of the country which says that this should guide, this philosophy should guide our, our country's development. 
So as a civil society organization, to really help develop the capacity of the Bhutanese, to really articulate that, understand it, live it, um, bring it down to the grassroots level. I think that's a critical role. And one entry point for that for us will be working closely with the education sector, because I think that's a very really important entry point for this country. So the long-term vision for Bhutan is really to work alongside the government and other partners to make GNH something living, breathing, and sustainable into the future for this country as it navigates through a very complex um, and challenging time in its, in its history. I think globally, um, the vision for the GNH Center is to be a, a hub and kind of a, a home base for others who are looking to implement similar programs and vision in their own countries. I think uh, there's increasing momentum and movement around this. It's taken us by surprise. I think it's beyond Bhutan. I think it reflects um, a growing unrest and dissatisfaction with the current economic system. So it's the extent that we can be a focal point, help translate this experience for other countries, that's part of our vision as well. Well, the Boomtang GNH Center is really going to be our geographic home base. Um, the land there is a really perfect example of bringing together all the different domains of gross national happiness. Right now, um, there isn't a lot of building happening on the land, so that's uh, a major part of our fundraising, is to actually develop the physical infrastructure for the center. And that will be using as much as possible um, sustainable and eco-friendly building approaches, uh, drawing on the cultural, um, culturally relevant uh, tools and textiles and wood carving and design to make it reflect a traditional Bhutanese living situation as much as possible, but updating it so that it's really um, the insulation, the water, the sanitation, all of it reflects the best of uh, green design. So that's going to be the physical center for, for the GNH uh, center. The programs right now are happening and I think that's an exciting part because I think the actual inner content or the programming should influence what the design of the external building is going to be. So I think it's not, uh, it's not a contradiction that to say that the programming starts first, we develop that, and then gradually the building comes up. So I think we're, we're continuing to expand our staff capacity here in Bhutan. We're uh, raising funds to create sustainable programs, not just for um, international visitors, but for the Bhutanese, and so that needs to be funded as well as um, developing the actual physical center in Bhutan. As we're getting more and more interest from others who want to implement GNH-inspired programs here in Bhutan and overseas, we're trying to develop their own capacity so that they don't just come here for a 10-day workshop and then leave, but they actually develop the skills to be able to pass that on to others. So that's what the Training of Trainers program is about. Um, we had one this month, which brought together 25 people, again, a mix of international and Bhutanese participants. And I think that's going to be an important way of kind of getting the word out and also building capacity so that the GNH Center becomes, again, the hub within a larger network that's working on GNH. I think there's a lot of interest in learning about GNH and to the extent that people can um, build linkages with the center, um, if there are particular institutions, uh, whether they're schools or NGOs or government bodies that are doing similar work and want to connect with us and develop programs and projects, I think that's one way of getting involved. I think if there are similar visions in terms of um, developing the GNH Center and people feel a commitment to supporting the growth of the GNH Center, then certainly contrib contributing funding and resources is a really concrete way of supporting the work that we're doing. And I think if people are just really interested in the ideas and wanting to find out what, more about what's going on, we're developing our social media and website and communication strategy. So I think that building a strong global movement around this is, is also a really important um, 
kind of uh, context for the work that we're doing. So getting involved in that way just through communication, networking, um, reaching out to others and reaching out to the GNH Center is another way of getting involved. I think one aspect of our uh, building out networks will be to link up with towns or states, communities that are wanting to implement GNH related work in their own context. Um, you could call it maybe gross international health, uh, or GNH is another way of short, shorthand for it. Uh, that will be an element of our programming as well. So I think one question that people often ask is, uh, is GNH uh, only good for Bhutan? Do you have to be a Buddhist country? Um, do you have to measure exactly the same nine domains for it to work? And I think the answer to that is, is definitely no. It's not about uh, cut and paste or importing something into another country. Um, it's really about adapting and, re and sort of innovating around the core principles of GNH. And that means taking what you're learning here in Bhutan and then fine-tuning it, adapting it, and then making it your own in your own context. And I think that kind of partnership and learning from each other is going to be really, really important. So those kinds of smaller satellite GNH programs or gross international happiness pro projects, I think, are really, really important and exciting. I think some, some governments are starting to move in the direction of implementing GNH by um, changing what they measure. So there are increasingly surveys that are similar to the GNH survey that are beginning to measure um, subjective well-being, uh, indices that include environmental um, outcomes as well. Uh, the GPI or Genuine Progress Indicator is another example. So governments taking an interest in measuring um, and acting on those measures is one way of implementing GNH. It's important that it's not just a survey that's done and then put on a shelf to collect dust. I think what's interesting about Bhutan is they're actually using the surveys to shape how they make policy. They have a policy screening tool in which um, they look at um, building projects or development projects through a GNH lens and then make a decision about whether to give it a green light or not based on that. It's similar to what you might think about as an environmental impact assessment but much broader, um, looking at a lot of other domains. So I think those are important ways that governments could look at GNH. I think another is to really look at the principles underlying GNH. So um, it's not just an external measure. It really comes from understanding of what makes people happy and what leads to unhappiness. Part of that uh, that's relevant to sustainable development is the idea of contentment or sufficiency. How much is enough? How much material consumption is actually enough? And how much does advertising and the increasing chase after the dollar actually lead to more suffering and unhappiness? So I think to the extent that governments can ask that question and be aware of the extent to which they are pushing things in one direction or another is really important. So I, I came to GNH from a long journey that started out as a medical doctor and really trying to understand health and what is the best way to help people be healthy. So initially it was working one-on-one -on -one as a doctor with patients and eventually realizing that the tools of the medical profession were very good at treating disease after the fact but not so good at preventing um, bad health or promoting good health. So that led eventually to working in international health and primarily in southern Africa uh, during the early days of the HIV epidemic. And I was involved in a study at that time that was really trying to look at the, the upstream causes of, of poor health and HIV, which in South Africa included um, a lot of uh, poverty, gender inequality, domestic violence that were driving the, the high-risk sexual behavior that in turn was driving the HIV epidemic. So it was um, really not just about giving antiretroviral drugs to people after they were infected, but going to communities, talking to young boys and young girls about sexuality, about gender, 
um, doing uh, kind of a, a review of the, the culture and, and what, what they say about uh, gender and domestic violence and then empowering girls and women um, to use microfinance loans to start their own income generating projects. All of this being a way to address HIV and at the time it was seen as uh, really outside of the box thinking because people were really focused on the medical model uh, but eventually the, the research caught on and was published and now um, this idea of addressing the structural factors underlying HIV uh, or structural interventions has become more mainstream and is, and is recognized as a way of addressing HIV. So that to me was the, the beginning of thinking more holistically about health. Um, GNH started to happen when I got more involved in development and in, in the environment. And at that point I was moving to the UN in New York and working with initially UNDP and then UNICEF. And I think there was a growing sense of frustration at um, the inability for us to really try to holistically address the causes of, of poor health, which in the face of climate change, in the face of growing e income inequalities, could not just be addressed through a health sector approach. So when the government of Bhutan presented on GNH at the UN on April 2nd of last year, I, I remember thinking, wow, this is something completely different and so needed. And, and beyond that, actually talking about the underlying spiritual values that drive how we approach development, you know, whether we consider um, other life forms, including plant life forms and animal life forms, as being important, equally important as humans in, in how we think about sustainability. That to me was revolutionary. The fact that they were saying that it needs to be a process of internal transformation and questioning and not just technical and material solutions was a conclusion I was coming to myself. It's not just about um, coming up with a, a magic bullet or a new technology that you can sort of drop into a country that will solve all the problems. It's the, our mindset. It's how are we living with each other. It's our sense of interdependence. It's whether we care about future generations. So I think moving in that direction, I realized that I could. it was difficult to um, work in that holistic way within a UN environment. There's a strong wish to work collaboratively, collaboratively across sectors, but it's still very hard to, to do that. So um, it was a great experience to work at sort of the global level, at a very high level, policy level in the UN, um, but it was clear that it was time to actually go back to the grassroots level and to really focus on a country that was trying something uh, radically different and, and really new. So I, I uh, decided to actually leave the UN at that point and to volunteer with the GNH Center. And my colleagues at the UN were really supportive and excited for me and I think are watching this page. But it's um, been quite a learning journey for myself, but it feels really right. It's, it's like uh, we don't have the time, um, in, in terms of where our planet is heading, we don't have the time to just keep using the conventional tools. We have to think outside the box. And if there's a country and a government that's really wish, wishing and willing to push the margins of what's possible, then I think we all need to support that process as much as we can. Where shall I seek the charming fair, direct the way, congenial song?